Cheers. Thank you. Okay, so whatever, there's 5, 10, 24 of us on the call. So it's definitely an uptick from last year. So good to see you all. Uh, what I'll do is I'll share my screen and jump straight into it, I think. Okay. I can see them, but I can't see the chat. That's disappointing. Okay, so if you can see the chat and someone's got a question, then throw throw them in as we're going along, I think. Well, I yep. just want to try and keep it as informal as possible. Okay, yep. great. So yeah, um, as was mentioned there, I have been looking well, over the past year at HTTP services um, in Rust and some event services, and I've been contributing and becoming part of sort of the Tide ecosystem, uh, which is a HTTP uh, framework, if you want to call it that, or set of libraries, I think is a better, a better description of it, um, that you can build uh, Rust uh, HTTP services in, okay? So it's based on standard async as opposed to Tokyo. And in my approach to it, it's been very, uh, how would you put it now? It, it, it felt very, very much, very familiar. Is that's the phrase I'm looking for? It felt very familiar in terms of its use of async and how it maps onto other techn web technologies that I've used, such as uh, Node.js. So it's really, it's really quite easy to sort of transition over. And what, I, what I've been doing over the past six months is looking at sort of development flows that can go around Tide um, that uh, will assist people who want to onboard into Tide um, and get them thinking about the types of practices that you need to put in place when using Rust in production scenarios. Okay, so specifically, then, what's driven? What's might been my motivation? So, apologies for some of the regulars. I did a talk around so sort the of benefits of using Rust HTTP for the new people. On I am mean, going to recap on sort of my points that I had there. Right. So, Rust is really, really good for serverless and container scenarios. Okay, and the reason for that is the low resource footprint. Okay, so when you compare it to the likes of Java and the likes of even Node.js. The density, the deployment density you can get with Rust services is an order of magnitude higher than you can with Java or uh, or Node. Um, that's that's not just sort of pulled out of thin air. There we, there's been quite a lot of numbers that have been shared with that. So I'm just introducing that more fully. I guess I work for IBM. I also work quite closely with the Red Hat team, and we're looking at sort of what is the best patterns for what. Are, yeah, what are the best patterns for container-based deployment, et cetera, et cetera. And one of these, one of the themes that we see again and again is how can we reduce the uh, the footprint of services. So Red Hat themselves, have, they've come out with a product called Quarkus, or the the, the product. It's an open source project that they're uh, they're uh, pushing or encouraging Java developers to move towards because it's a compile to native um, uh, for for, for the Java language. So you don't get the same amount of uh, overhead as you would with the traditional JVM. So, with, and nodes got Pacina going on, et cetera, et cetera. So low resource footprint is definitely critical as we look at re responsible computing and that type of stuff, okay? Quick startup time. So that's that's a given. And then I think Rust excels here as well compared to other JVM based, based languages. There's no, there is no startup time if you want to in comparison. And then, so the last point around sort of zero garbage collection, I think, what we've seen with the, with the likes of Discord, the blog posts uh, from Discord is, well, Go is giving certainly quite good performance into, for APIs into the hot code paths. The GC is it's really, really hurting people who are building, uh, building APIs and, and endpoints with, uh, uh, with, with Go. And while it gave them some acceleration to start off with, it's given them it's given the pain in production. Okay, so that's that's the reasoning behind why I'm why I like it. It's I like the development patterns with Tide, and I also like this um, this highly performant and energy efficient computing. I think we're going to see more of that over the next ten years. Okay, but the build times are excruciating. Okay, 
So there's a really good blog post on this uh, by Luca um, Palmieri. It's, it's a link at the bottom of the slide there. I think, I think he runs the London, uh, the London Rust Group. But um, basically, if the slow build times of Rust really impact the uh, production scenarios, because it give, as, as this sort of set of four points makes, you get your slow builds reduce your deployment frequency by the fact they're slow. That means in, in scenarios then, or what we see happening in, in real world scenarios is that this leads to batched up changes. And then batched up changes means you've got a higher deployment risk. And ultimately what that means is you don't have a, six, a fixed forward option. So that means that if you see an issue in production, you can't patch it and go forward. What you see is a lot of people looking uh, or implementing rollback strategies. And that's, that's not good. And what tends to happen in that scenario is you, you're not heading towards a continuous deployment, small changes are, are good type scenarios. You're sort of moving the clock backwards in terms of the um, uh, of your development and your deployment practices. Okay, so well, from an inner loop perspective, slow builds feel poor. From a production perspective, they're actually quite a serious symptom. Okay, so what I wanted to do what I've been looking at over the past six months is how can you give a better developer experience? How can you reduce the discovery cycle? So what do I mean by that? When you go and you take on a new fr uh, web framework or a, a new set of libraries, sort of how they piece together is, is problematic or it's, it's a, not, yeah, it's problematic, but it's a, it's a journey of discovery for users when really perhaps what you want is just just give me, well, well, you need to go on that journey of discovery at some stage. You definitely don't want it as the first step. You just want to say, give me something that works and I'll sort of understand it from running code and build it out from there. So you want uh, the opportunity, so you want best practices there. You want, you want to reduce the discovery life, life cycle. You want to, but that said, you want to provide guide rails and not a decree. So what you see happening with a lot of frameworks is battery included, do it this way or and you can't do it any other way so i didn't want to build something that was that sort of prescriptive so that's not something that i've uh, that i'm trying to achieve with uh, with roche and um i also sort of want to reduce the cognitive load so i'm very very excited about what's going on in serverless and wanted to uh, take that idea of removing all the sort of application infrastructure as much the application of infrastructure as you possibly could from sort of the development environment it's still accessible you can still do things at that level if you want but by default it's it's there's an abstraction there that hides it away and that's in terms of the driver for roche it's reduced primarily it's reduced the build times but it's also looking at these uh, sort of development aspects as well okay so, as I mentioned then, I, I'm focusing on Tide here. So, why Tide? We're getting feedback from users. So, we're bringing it out to the, into the wild and people are picking up uh, production uh, for production workloads. And people are getting their hands dirty with it. And it's a delightful DX. And I put that in quotes because it is a quote. People are really excited um, and really enjoying just writing HTTP services in Tide. I am personally as well, I'm feeling that same thing. So um, that's why Roche focuses on that, okay? I've also created this idea of project templates. So you have sort of pre-canned things that you can run um, and you can build your own project templates as well. And I've also looked at how to improve Docker layer caching. So, and this is really, I won't call it the secret sauce, but this is the approach that I've used to get the, the build times and the, the sort of that accelerated development experience. So getting as much pre-compilation into the flow as you possibly can. And because I've made upfront decisions around using Tide, I'm gonna use templates, sort of doing that in, 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 a scenario, in this scenario is quite easy. In a general scenario, so building, uh, building Docker layer caching for Rust projects in the general. I'll speak more about that sort of later, but that's not what this is for. This is an implementation of Docker layer caching. Okay. Um, and then the other aspect of this is a, a lot of these types of tools 
um, sort of give an opinion around not just build, but how do you deploy this into an environment? And I'm not particularly interested in solving that. I think there's too many different versions of what people want in order to build it into a, just a, a tool that I, I'm just using to sort of hone my uh, hone my skills in Rust and uh, and just focus on, like I say, the developer experience. So I, di I didn't want something you could go from uh, code and push it into an environment because then all of a sudden I've got to support lots of different cloud environments. Um, and people have a very different point of view on what CICD uh, should be. So what does it look like when it goes into Jenkins? Where's the GitHub actions? All these types of things. It, the artifacts that are produced by Rush um, are compatible with that, but it doesn't enforce any of that. Okay, so it's, def it's just all Rush is, just a command line tool for initializing a project um, and building that project as fast as possible into a Docker container. And then wherever, whatever you want to do with that afterwards is up to you. Okay, so that's what it is. I am going to jump in straight into a demo now. So let me uh, let me go. Are there any questions while I'm just jumping into the command line? What in particular drives the build times up for this tied subsystem? Like Rust has a pretty fast compiler. So. Where basically it's the amount of dependencies and the amount of code that needs to be built. So there are smart things in Rust where it it does it can cache. Okay, so from a development point of view, you can check out a project, take the hit of the first build, and then from that point on, you are you're just compiling what's changed. So Rust itself is very smart about that. The problem is that when you check out a clean set of code into a clean, uh, into an environment. You, you, everything's cold. So you're building from cold there. And that's when your build times go up to sort of the, the 20 minute mark, you know, for a reasonable, for a mid sized project. Yeah, thanks. In, and, and that's just from a develop build perspective. So if you're running with release as well, there's additional checks and, and optimizations that go into the code. So actually, what I'm going to do here is hold this in. If I go. So hopefully I put the link into the meetup notes. Um, so this is the sort of landing page that I sort of put together for, for the tool. This was just, a, just an excuse to look at MD book more than anything else, but I'm, I'm sort of quite happy with how it turned out. Okay. So sort of full, some of that discussion that I mentioned there in terms of motivations up there. But there's, uh, there's just some simple, there's some tutorials here on the left hand side. And, and really what I'm going to do here is just step through this and just explain a little bit of, of, of what's going on there. Okay. So, um, so yeah, if I probably need to, no, there we go. Bump it up a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna make a directory and keep there. And I'm gonna call this tied files. Files for function as a service. Um, all right. Uh, you'll probably tell I have been testing this throughout the day. So let's go there. Okay, so I'm gonna CD into this directory. And I'm just going to create just a simple sort of tied function here. Okay, so let's go uh, just Roche in it. And let's have a look at that. Let's not have a look at it there. Let's have a look at it there. Okay, so when you initialize, this is like the base, basic, simple, uh, simplest project that I could think of putting together. And as you can see, there's no cargo project that wraps around this. It is literally just a function that I can extend and build a HTTP uh, application around, okay? So what happens to this when you run a build, and I'll do that now, is that it, it that file is picked up, put into a Docker container, which has the rest of the application infrastructure pre-built and creates an executable for you, okay? 
that's what's going on there. If we look at, we dive into the project website. This is the GitHub repository for it, okay? So in this example, I've got sort of, wow, the template's there for a simple function. I've sort of got little references from, uh, to build out JSON, um, uh, JSON applications and uh, a, a more complete application and sort of look at building requests as well and, and sort of passing those out. So some examples in there. And as well, if you go to the Tide website, um, and look at the and look at some of the examples in there. Apart from the middleware one, most of these will work as well. So there's lots of sort of examples that you can you can sort of target at as well. If if, if you just wanted the uh, the simple function as a service uh, type approach, okay. So then, if we go back to the instructions, do you have the instructions? So I know what I'm doing. Okay, so we've got that function. Uh, actually, let's edit that code as well. Uh, okay, let's go into. I've now got too many screens open really for this, but there you go. Um. So I've already logged in and now I'm just going to build the function. Okay. So as I said, that's all that's, all that's happening here is it's copied the file over into a, a predefined Docker container, and it's now going to run, uh, run, the, run the build, okay? So typically, if I would run that for the first time, it, it usually takes around two minutes to build this, to build Tide as a, uh, as a, as a single sort of app, in fact, sometimes a bit more. Um, but now I've started a new project and it's built that for me in whatever, 10, 15 seconds, which is a lot, lot better developer experience. But it's not just going to do that on my machine. It's going to do that all the way through the build pipeline as well. OK, so that's the build done. So I can now see this. I can now see this. Uh, it's, it's built it as dev tied files. OK, if I copy that, I can now run that. Um, Container. Okay. And I can browse that here and hopefully if everything's um, so hello Russ Dublin. Ta-da. So everything's working locally as as I expected it. Okay. So fantastic. Let's just kill that service now. If we go, uh -huh. okay. So now what I'm going to do is, as well as having sort of that development build type thing. I'm now going to I'm I'm going to build it as a release and that so I can deploy it to uh, to a container environment. Okay, so if we go back in here, what I'm doing is oh, oh uh, I'm gonna put it into key. Um, my namespace is number nine. And let's call this Tide Fuzz Dublin so I don't get a name clash. Okay. As you can see, this release build is a bit longer. It's almost 20 seconds. So that's why you sort of have that dev cycle, but you you the, the release is a bit uh, the release is a specific action. Okay. So it's created this for me. 
And what I'm going to do now is uh, push that up to uh, a image repository. And hold this. And then sort of show the other side of the deployment if I can get my uh, cut and paste bits going properly. Okay, cool. So if I go to that repository now, up on key.io, sign in. Uh, I'm going to take this away because it's been recorded. When you push a repository, uh, when you push, sorry, a container into key by default, it sets it up as a private one, just in case you, uh, you did that by mistake. So rather than having sort of setting up the keys between key and the platform that I'm going to deploy to, I'm just going to make this public. Okay. So uh, where's that gone now? Uh, make public. There we go. Okay, cool. So that's now available to the rest of the world. All right. So what I want to do now is I'm going to publish this into a uh, container platform, specifically into a Knative platform. Okay, so the one that we have at work, the one that sort of we're busy putting together at the moment, it's just coming to beta, is Code Engine. Okay, so Code Engine is our implementation or our, our runtime of uh, our deployment, should I say, of Knative, which is an open source project, sits on top of Kubernetes. Um, it's directly comparable to the likes of Google Run. It's also uh, got a similar services up now on DigitalOcean as well. So this type of flow that I'm showing doesn't, you don't necessarily have to use, we don't have to use IBM Cloud Code Engine at all. You can, you can use any container environment. Um, but the flow that I'm, that I'm sort of demonstrating here should map over to them. They all have this sort of build a container, point your environment to that container, and it runs automatically. And we're seeing that and more and more of that sort of come in uh, to the different container offerings. Um, you can also, I think I mentioned this before, you can also have that type of deployment on-prem with an OpenShift environment as well. So all this type of management infrastructure is built into OpenShift if you wanted that. Uh, somewhere else. But uh, anyway, that's uh, enough of the salesy pitch. So what I've done in Code Engine, you have this idea of a project um, and projects have applications. So I'm going to pray to the demo guards now that this beta doesn't let me down. So I'm going to refresh that because it might want to log in. Yeah, okay, so I have a project. And there's two types of runtime within this, uh, within Code Engine. There's applications, which is standard HTTP applications, which is what I'm going to be looking at here. And then there's, uh, there's jobs as well. So we also use it as a batch processing, or we're looking to use it as a batch processing sy uh, system for AI and data, uh, that type of thing. So. So I'll, this is a more complicated one that I did earlier. So I'm not, I'll, I'll be coming back to that. But what I'm going to do here is create an application from a container image. I'm going to point it to um, the one I've just published. And uh, for runtime settings, because I'm using Rust now, I can, it, it defaults to a gig in memory, but I'm going to take it down to the minimum because uh, like I say, with Rust, we just don't need a gig of memory to just host the HTTP server. It doesn't make sense, okay? And then you can set some scaling options on this. And like I say, all these cloud platforms, uh, these container platforms have this type of thing. So you can set a timeout um, and then you can set your concurrency as well. So if, if the service is dealing with 100 requests, then auto scale and auto scale to a max of 10 instances. Um, but when you're not running, scale all the way down to zero. So if there's no requests after a certain amount of time, it'll just turn them off and then you'll have a, a, a cold start. I can also pass environment variables into that, but I'm not doing that this time. I'm going to give this a name. So Rust Dublin. Oh, it's going to clash with something, isn't it? Uh, okay. I also, I can, I'm pointing directly to the container image here. I can also 
point at some source code and we'll sort of look at that on the next step, but uh, sort of the next run through this. Let's just create that. Okay, and it's gone off, tell me where it is. I can probably look at some deployment logs, I hope. If this is working properly. Came up before the logs came up. There we go. Anyway, so now I have an application URL. It spins me into that. I've got HTTPS on it or by, by auto magic. And it's now hello uh, Dublin. Okay. So that's why, sort of, that's the end to end. And that's why I'm sort of interested in, uh, in these HTTP applications and, and accelerating this sort of development and deployment sort of life cycle. Okay. So, like, that was okay. That's a simple function, but everyone's sort of looking at each other and going, what about the tests? Sort of, what about that? Sort of a bit of a bit more robustness about the code. So what I want to do is just share now a, a sort of a more, a, a more complete project as well. So as well as sort of a simple function, I mentioned that you can have templates. So if we go into... But I've also built out uh, some uh, some templates with pat with patterns in there. Okay, so I built sort of a default template that has Serdi in there. Um, it has um, some of the standard tied libraries in there that can just that will just get you up and running and offer more functionality. Okay, so what this does so what what this does is the Roche uses Cargo Generate under the hood to go and download projects and use those projects within this flow. So the idea is that people can build their own GitHub repo or take a fork of this, add their own things into this cargo.taml, uh, Tommel, sorry, and have their own uh, have their own build system that leverages the approach, but they don't have to come and put pull requests necessarily into this repo in order to use it. They can just, when they're running the init command, they can just pass the repo name as a location and you'll get it automatically, okay? So again, I do have a default, so I'll just CD it this. And so I go Roach init and I say, I want a default project. Um, default, like I say, for init, I can put in a template if I want, but I'm just going to do that. Promise for a project name, let's call this demo two. It goes off, pulls everything from default and creates demo two. So if I CD into demo two now, we can go in, uh, we'll start with the source, okay? So uh, actually, so the source in this one is there's a bit more going on. And um, because it's one of the libraries that it imports is a uh, surf library. So I've, I've given a sort of an example. Surf is the client of Tide. So Tide's the, uh, the HTTP server. Rust, uh, surf is the, uh, the client that we use. So there's a reference, sort of quick reference implementation of there for the pointers towards the docs, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and what you also have in there is a lib. So if we um, if we look at this, this is a simple. The library is just a test, okay, and it's exercising the function handler um, uh, out, um, without going over HTTP. It's just directly referencing the library, okay. So that's what's going on, sort of in there. So you're starting to get. A bit more, uh, a bit more code in there, okay, and a bit more, sort of a, a bit more of a pattern and a template. Um, and if we CD into tests, then you and we look at this, you also get an integration test. So rather than just uh, exercising the library, you get an integration test that exercises over HTTP as well, okay. And again, the template has. So if we cast uh, re oh. The readme in there has the steps sort of in your project of how to sort of build and, and sort of execute and run this project. Okay. So you get, it's, a, it's the same thing, 
um, because the um, uh, but it's the same thing, but just with, in terms of the, the pattern, but there's just more code in there and there's more, you've got a proper cargo project this time. So that probably appeals more to sort of rust, sort of more fervent rust people. And um, uh, yeah, it's a bit, there's, a bit, there's benefits in there as well. Okay. So that's, so once you've done that, what you can do is, it, so let's say rather than what I just did, which was uh, in the previous demo, which was just build a, H build a container, push that container into a registry, and then um, and then pull that pull from that registry into the runtime. Some people like a bit more fanfare about the deployments, or a bit more rigor, if you want to call it that. So they they want you want to check the code in, um, build it build it in a CI/CD environment, and then sort of deploy it sort of out of the back of that. Okay. And sort of Roche supports that, but quite simply, actually, if we go into source and uh, Roche, uh, I can't remember the name for this now. Yeah, it's Jen. There we go. So, um, so what Roche Gen does is give you a, it generates a Docker file for you based on what's in that folder. So you can attach you can attach, use that Docker file within your CI CD environment in order to contain, create your containers. Okay, so rather than having to install Roche in your build systems, it generates a Docker file. The Docker file references that base container, that builder. The builder builds the app once um, in release mode. It can run a test as well. You can, it can test it before it sort of does the copy of that, uh, of that artifact into the container and generates sort of the final thing that you're going to deploy into the production environment. Okay, so that's that, that's how it would be attached. So then if we look at sort of, okay, what does that, what does that look like then from, from what I showed you in terms of uh, code engine, if what I did previously was, if I go to my GitHub profile, github.com, uh, I don't know what I called it now. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is a similar project that I did early, sort of earlier on to, uh, earlier on today. Okay, so then in my code engine environment, what I did was we we got support for builds in here. So if I go, click in my Rust project. Um, I've got this image build and I've configured this build um, to look at that repo. It's going to look at branch main and my context directory for the build is dot source. Okay. Um, I'm telling it it's a Docker file. So it knows to go and pick up that Docker file and run that Docker file and it outputs to an internal container registry in this. So I'm not put in this scenario, I'm not pushing it into key, I'm pushing it into the internal registry in, uh, in IBM Cloud, okay? And then I can go back and I create an application based on that build then. So I got a demo app and this, um, and th which is, configured to look at that the output of the um, of that build process. Okay, so what's interesting about this is I no longer have sort of an external CI CD system. My CI CD is embedded within my application kind of environment. Okay, so it's not it, it's not like you're passing it sort of from one system over here into another system um, down here or something like that. It's like all contained within within the con contained within the container environment. Can I say that? I probably can, can I? Yeah, I just did. Anyway, the, um, uh, and yeah, so that's, that's the two kind of different flows. Hopefully you can see what I'm talking about in terms of supporting the different potential CI CD processes that, that can come out of this scenario. So it's, um, yeah. Uh, that's that's where that's got to so far. So while I jump back in, 
Are there any questions on the glass of water? Anton, do you have sort of support for a full, I mean, that cargo project there that you've got, is that like a essentially a full cargo project? So if I open it in Visual Studio, uh, essentially Rust Analyzer works, I can do cargo build, those sort of things, or is it more of a still depends on Rush to, to build? No, so that's a really good point. And that's why I wanted to open it in Visual Studio code. <laughs> So it is a self-contained library in and of itself, okay? So if we, I'll just quit this for now. Okay, so if we, uh, if we look at the cargo.toml, okay? So this project, you can build this project and it will, execute uh, and when you run the test it'll test the route okay so, and you can do that locally if you want to spend the time on a build you can actually do that locally then you don't have to um, uh, 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 you, you don't have to use docker if you don't want to I'm, I'm actually why not I'm going to spin this off in the background uh, So the code that's in that source file that you get is valid code. I think well, that's your question, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Just essentially a valid cargo solution. Yeah, yeah. So, but, and again, this is the trade-off. It, it is a valid cargo solution. It's a valid tied solution as well in, in so much as it exposes a route. That, and again, this is the definitely the trade-off of it is the fact that you are... Uh, your, uh, your application, in quite a, your, some of your application infrastructure is pushed into something that's already pre-built, okay? So that's great if you're, if you're looking for quick builds and you're doing test-driven development, et cetera, et cetera. If you are building out, if you're doing a discovery piece, so you don't quite know what projects you want in there, you don't know what your dependencies are, et cetera, et cetera, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go and use Roche at that stage. You would you'd want to understand what your domain space is, and then once you have you have something, it's like that's when you want to cookie cutter them out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and I think it's like I mean this just it, this is a side project, but if I was to if I was to go seriously at this, what you'd want to be able to do is that temp the, the building of the um, template projects. You'd want to automate that and allow people to generate those template projects very, very simply. So they, they sort of build a solution and just go Roche template and it will put it into Git, Roche template, give it a GitHub location and it will generate the, the backend container for you and it will do all that type of stuff. But like I say, it's not, a, it's not really a commercial thing, but that, that at the moment is done by hand. So, um, so question, David here. <clears throat> so if I understood correctly, you have some pre-baked uh, dependencies um, that you can only use in the business logic, and you can't add any additional dependencies really from your business logic because there's no cargo file. Well, you, you can. Sorry, the way that you would add dependency is by creating a template. Okay, yeah. so okay. there's this default one here. Okay, and I've got there's another project here which is the MongoDB one. Um, and that's got, a, that's got all the MongoDB ten, uh, dependencies that are required for, for doing a MongoDB style application. And the point is here that you can fork these and use them within Roche without having to change Roche. Like it, it's the, the coupling between these template projects and Roche is loose. Does that make sense, David? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thanks. Yeah. So it's it's quite useful if you've got a you know business case, I guess, where you need to build I don't know twenty Rust services, and they will have similar dependencies and that sort of thing. You could just create your own template and use that for all of them. Yes. Yeah, and that's I yeah absolutely, and 
that's that is a really that is the prime use case for it yeah yeah so we do see that when we and again it's back to what we spoke about last year the um in terms of adopting it in sort of custom application development type scenarios like with, with professional services organizations these types of accelerators are kind of what they look for you know they actually do have 20 or 30 developers building hundreds of services for their customers you know so we need that type of tooling within Rust in order to get that. And I, I'm going to hate myself for saying this, but enterprise adoption. You know? <laughs> yeah. If, if you don't have it, 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 it doesn't happen. Um, so <clears throat> the, the IBM cloud, right? Does it do any magic with those Docker containers? You call this a function. Uh, but is it like a sort of Lambda function similar to AWS where those containers are in and out at of scope depending on the the usage or is it well it is a standalone docker container running there permanently and whether somebody's accessing it or not it's still there and you have to pay for it yeah that's a really good question i, I could have almost paid you to ask that question so yeah Brother. there is no <laughs> I, there's no I idea credit magic. cards <laughs> yeah do you? yeah i'll just uh, I'll just text it over there yeah so this and this is why i love sort of the Knative piece about it, the fact that sort of code engines built on Knative is there's no, there's no magic there. Literally what, what you saw me build, I built a container, uh, pushed it into a, a key, which is just a, a repository that has better, uh, it's a, sorry, registry that has better repository restrictions than Docker does nowadays. So it just tends to work for me a bit better. But anyway, that's all, slightly off topic. So if I built that container. That container I can put anywhere. I can put that in Kubernetes now if I wanted to. I could put it. I put it in Code Engine. I could put it in ECS, EKS, whatever you want to put it. There's no okay. additional magic there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, that function, well, that container is running all the time, no matter what. There's no spin up, spin down, depending on the usage and such. Oh, no, there is. Yeah, so for the magic, if we go back in here. Sorry, in here. If we look at the configuration, the magic for spin up, spin down is configured in the platform. So I don't put that mm. magic into my Tide application. That's given to me by IBM Cloud or whatever the Knative runtime is, whatever the Kubernetes runtime is. So mm. I say here, for this configuration of this deployment, give me scale from 0 to 10. Okay. As you can see now, because I turned off for a bit, it's down to zero instances. So if, hopefully if I launch that. And now I've got, and hopefully this will update for me now as well. But that, the, um, that's, where the, that's where the auto scaling comes from. Okay. There you go, right. one instance. So, did I have any other words here? Right, yeah, so demo, right. Sorry to labor the point here, but and I'll just skip over, just go over this likely. I don't think there's many, uh, much points I want to make here. But what we saw was a Git, there was a Git template, which was the default projects or the MongoDB template type project. We used Roche to pull that down and create a local project. We Docker built it pushed it into a container registry. And from that container registry, we, we created an app and we browsed the application. Okay, so that's, that's what we did. So there are other things and other people that are thinking about this flow. Um, like I mentioned Roche here, the other ones that, uh, that I'm aware of here, these are the open source ones. There may be other platforms that are providing similar types of tooling but I haven't investigated those. I'm only really interested in the open source ones. So Red Hat's one is uh, Odoo, uh, OpenShift Do. This is a beast, uh, an absolute beast. So it, it caters for Java. It caters for that, that real enterprise scenario where you have multiple services. Um, this is next door to Docker Compose++. Plus plus. Um, Great at what it does, but it's not really that single application type scenario that I'm trying to capture as well. 
But um, if you're interested in this type of what tooling is, is sort of around this type of thing, then go and look at Odo. Um, the Bison project is more aligned with what I'm trying to achieve with the function as a service piece. Um, I am interested in looking at how we could potentially migrate some of the functionality from Roche into the B, uh, the Boson project. Um, again, it's written in Go, so it's not necessarily it's not what I necessarily want to do as a side project. But uh, I think it could be interesting if we're looking at uh, getting more tied adoption and becoming part of a wider ecosystem. But that's uh, it's very it's very early days. But in, even within uh, Boson, they've yet to have a Rust implementation they've got support for go and java and node and all these types of things so there's going to be some teething problems with it and what i find is that this the step build that we want isn't necessarily what anybody what any other project wants um so why would you have that in javascript so actually introducing that phased or cache docker build type idea can be uh, can be problematic or can be can be a change, but to be fair, I haven't spoken to anybody in those projects about this yet. Um, uh, so we'll see, we'll see where we get to with it. But, um, but yeah, if you're interested in this type of thing, definitely go and check out those things as well. So what did I learn during this then? So I love MD Book. It is amazing for just putting together like a half grown up website. It's, it's so quick. Uh, and then just publishing it on Netfly, um, yeah, a couple of couple of days I think, just writing up my notes. Did it as I was sort of going, doing the build as well. Um, so writing code, putting the tests in, and then uh, putting the documentation in at the same time. Um, what I would like to look at is actually hosting the ND book within the application code as well. But I, I didn't look at that. But that type of workflow, I, I really really enjoyed. So definitely, if you if you're building something, it's getting a bit of teeth. Think about bringing your M book, uh, MD book into your into your dev flow there. Cargo generate is what I'm using to sort of download those projects, give the project a name, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This was uh, Ashley Williams. She did this a couple of years ago, but she's actually created a, an organization for it now. If you're doing any stuff in Rust and you you've got some example code in your project, you might want to look at using cargo generate. It's, it's, it's installable at the command line, so you can cargo install, cargo generate, that will give you cargo generate and you can point it to a, um, a GitHub repo. Um, so it's really good to build sample apps or deliver sample apps for your end users. So I know some of us in the, uh, in the community of building out sample, uh, building out libraries and that type of thing. If you want to kickstart people up and running, then I would strongly recommend having a go and look at uh, Cargo Generate. Its use case was for WASI. For the, um, she built it to deliver that WASI experience, um, which is fantastic. Um, and like I say, it's really good that she's donated it now to a, to a, a shared project. She's got a good few collaborators in there. And the... Uh, final one I want to call out here is Cargo Chef. So a lot of what I built in terms of the staging of Docker, um, and, sorry, doing pre-builds and then pushing files into that, um, I, I would say I pushed that as far as it should go. Like the fact that I'm just dealing with a file and a test is as much as I think I'd want to do with using that approach. I should imagine doing any more would get messy quite quickly. I'm, I'm comfortable with what, uh, with what Rush can do. And like it, it, it's only two files at the end of the day, but doing more complicated, like full-blown web applications using, using this, I don't think, uh, like I'm thinking more of a monolithic style application than uh, like I wouldn't do it using this, I, uh, I don't think. And I wouldn't twist Roche into doing that. This is for sort of building backends, single hit backend services. Um, uh, that very microservice based architecture approach, not, not like, a, like a, like I say, a monolithic or a self-contained system type architecture. So, but if you do like that idea of having pre-canned Docker builds or pre-canned uh, uh, 
yeah, uh, Docker development lifecycle. Look at Cargo Chef. I think Javi pointed me at this um uh before christmas when i was chatting to him i was showing him what i was doing with roche he was saying oh have you had a chat with, uh, had a look at this i think to bring this into roche i, I don't think it'd buy me that much uh, at this stage because I, i'm not going much further in in terms of what i'm doing um around the caching but i i definitely if i was doing more production rust in big projects i'd be looking at cargo share okay that's all i have there we go. Apologies. I didn't mean to scroll that long. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. It was very, very inspiring. Uh, we do use a similar flow uh, in, in our company, that uh, development lifecycle. It's very similar to what we are using. Cool. And you, is that in Rust or is that? Uh, uh, no, it's, it's a generic one. Uh, so we are using Jenkins to run our CDCI pipeline, and the pattern that we are following is similar to that. So we we force people to create Docker files, etc., for the repo, and then we have uh, pre-built, pre-configured uh, Jenkins files, Jenkins files, and then uh, it assumes that certain files are there, and then builds uh, your stuff, and then pushes into a private repository that we have. Okay, yeah. And then from there, uh, you do whatever you want, but we use Kubernetes uh, to deploy those applications. And it's very easy to roll back and roll forward. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Kubernetes. Cool. Are there any, any questions? I have one, Anton, as a kind of a novice Rust user, and not, I suppose related to a lot of what you talked about, about stability in production, but what are the gotchas in Rust for going to production and being in production, if you had any tips for someone who's thinking about it? Oh, I would say productionizing any runtime for an organization is always really, really tough because it's not just the development team that you're um, that you need to orientate. It's your operations folks. It's your testers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think, uh, especially the operations folks, like, are, do they do? Is what you're building properly integrated into their flow? So, are you logging as you'd expect? Does it talk to the systems? And then, can they troubleshoot in the same way? So, I know. Like the, to take for take for example for Java the sort of runtime because it's got the JVM but a lot of the run the sort of analytics and the uh, analysis that you can do on the performance of the JVM and sort of troubleshooting that is like that's whatever 20, 30 years of is it thirty shit it's almost thirty years of Java now is it twenty five years at least anyway it's a long time that's gone into productionizing that like Rust doesn't have the overhead of the JVM but at the same time production tooling is uh, it needs to be worked out in terms of best practices, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of what I'm teasing at with this. So the likes of the um, providing patterns that demonstrate um, sort of integration with Prometheus, all these types of things. I also do a bit of work on post-mortem analysis as well, sort of what, what do core dumps look like in Rust? What flags do you need to turn on in order to make sure that your core dumps are, make any sense? Like how can you how can you use things like EBF trace, which actually was another talk I wanted to do tonight, but uh, we went for this. But yeah, like using using dynamic tracing and system facilities, what can you do there? Um, yeah, uh, there's probably some good there's patterns out there in terms of the development piece. And then there's probably some good production examples, but I, can, I am going to bring folks to this meetup to discuss that in more detail. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So it sounds like it's kind of like just behaving as if in, in production. So there's no surprises, everybody, everything behaves like it used to and the tooling is available essentially. And when you get to that tooling, just as a personal opinion, how do you think it's evolving within Rust? Like a lot, a lot of, like, like uh, I noticed, I don't know if someone for the Visual Studio there, just showing how old I am, but the original one of that for C++ was an incredible piece of kit. And for Java and C++, it was very strong, but you rarely find tooling as strong as that for other languages. So I think, 
and other people have probably got opinions, so feel, feel free to jump in. Apart from like whatever whatever glitch was going on there with VS Code, but like Microsoft are very very heavily invested in Rust. Right. Like the the RLS integration, uh, the, sorry, the language server integration into uh, Visual Studio Code is is fantastic. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. But um, I I would say and to, to the point where yeah, you can write production systems in that. It's not like you're. I was in Vi for a while there, but. It's not like you have to be in Vi for this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'd say it's it's first class. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts, like yeah. web storms or whatever else. The the, thing thanks, you know that? From the tools that I've tried so far, IntelliJ, the C Lion, the paid version has the by far the best support for Rust, including the debugger. Um, the open source uh, IntelliJ. It has the same support, but no debugger. So if, if you're okay with not debugging your code, it's probably the best choice. Um, in comparison to VS Studio or v, uh, the code, um, IntelliJ has a slightly better integration in terms of running the project straight away. You don't have to create additional tasks. You don't have to download any plugins or anything like that. So. Um, so from that perspective, it is slightly better. Thanks. Also, I think over the last year, things have changed quite a bit. Like when I first, first started using VS Code with Rust a year ago, it was on the old language server before Rust Analyzer was out or stable. And now it's a lot better. It's much easier to do stuff and the IntelliSense and that sort of thing works pretty well. Mm. Um, the other good resource potentially to look at, um, that chap you mentioned, Luca Palmieri, is busy writing a book on productionizing Rust. Um, and yeah, there's a few chapters he's put out. Uh, it's worth going and having a look, and look at his blog and uh, going through it. It's actually some really good stuff there with some patterns. Yeah, it's a good tip. Thanks. I actually, I actually bought the book today. So I think one of the slides... I had in here referred to his. Um, it did, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's the second time I've uh, like I've referred to him in this. So I just went right. I'm going to buy the book. It's about thirty quid. So uh, and if you if you get it from Ireland, you get a little discount code as well. Uh, I can't remember what the discount code is, but yeah, definitely buy his book. Give him the support. Um, 